Welcome to the GCN Tech Clinic, where Alex and I aim to answer your bike tech and maintenance related questions. As ever, you can submit your questions down below in the comments section using the hashtag AskGCNTech, and we'll do our best to answer as many of them as possible within the allotted time. Who's first? Right, let's not waste it. At Par Hansen. Here's another question for you. Is it safe to inflate TPU tubes with a CO2 cartridge, or can the tube or valve be damaged by the cold? And how is it with the heat from electrical mini pumps? Can they cause problems? Um, yes, both of those methods can cause problems, and I have seen them happen in the past. Um, so I would be mindful of this in this situation. Things that you can do uh, when using an electric mini pump is use a separate attachment that goes in between the valve and the pump, which will help to remove some of the heat issue from that. Because if you're using a TPU tubes, quite often they have a plastic um, valve stem, which can well, be damaged. One important thing to point out is that the uh, to peak the electric mini pump yeah. is designed so that it doesn't melt your valve. Yeah, but a lot of the initial of ones that are like the Chinese sort of initial cheaper ones, yeah. that is a difference. I've seen it. Yeah. My friends have melted their valves. Yeah, so I think that the key bit is that section in between them, isn't it? Mm. Um, but CO2 cartridge, sort of a little decoupler. Yeah, I've used CO2 cartridges on TP tubes and have had no problem whatsoever. <laughs> but I think you do run that risk of the material becoming so cold it becomes very brittle and could potentially split. Yeah, but the temperature should dissipate pretty quickly to yeah. the point where it won't be brittle. Yeah. It, so in my mind, you, you should be fine if you're just a little bit mindful of this stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Oz Madman next saying, great show, always look forward to what's coming next. Two questions, one for Ollie and then one for Alex. What is it that a heavier rider uh, in a flat time trial, why is it that a heavier rider on a flat time trial is faster than a lighter rider, even though they put out the same average power in watts for the race? Um, and two, I'm building a new road bike and considering going for Shimano 105 DO2 for the first time. I currently use uh, 5339 and I used to spin out with a 5236. Uh, so oh, we're about gearing, gearing options. options. Right, you do the first question then. Um, so the first, the, here? the first one is down to um, it. It's basically like on the flat. It's down to something known as like allometric scaling principles, and this is the whole reason why um, huge cargo ships are a thing. So if you think about a cargo ship, it's We've got a huge volume cargo capacity, but the front end stays quite small. So relative to how much power they're able to produce, like larger riders are better at time trialing usually because although their um, volume of their size is increasing, like as a cubed function, yeah. their frontal area <coughs> doesn't increase as a cubed function. So. Okay. You, you, you increase in volume, but your frontal area, which is the most important thing when you're taking considering aerodynamics, uh, doesn't increase at the same scaling factor. All right, makes sense to me. I'll go with that. And then in terms of this gear and uh, gearing options here, they're saying about uh, will uh, modern 105 DI2 accept 5339 chain rings and an 11 to 28 cassette? Um, Yes, it will. You just have to adjust the front derailleur for it and account for that in the Shimano eTube app to tell it what gear ratios you're using. But I, I would say if you're going to use 5339 chain rings, I would probably consider running the 30 cassette or maybe even the 34 just so you've got that wider, wider range of gears, especially on 12 speed because it means the jumps between the gears are closer anyway. Mm. Um, so your chain ring options, yes. 1128, yes, but I would probably opt for the bigger cassette. Nice. There you go. Um, um, shall I give this one? Nick, next question. Nick Wakeford. They say. Qu question for me. Oh, yeah, I'll read it out. It's for you oh. then. Um, what is better for fuel economy? Bikes on the roof rack with them facing forwards, i.e., their most aerodynamic position, <laughs> or on a tow bar and rear rack, but being sideward, probably least aerodynamic for the bike. Current system is roof racks with two bikes, adds about 30 to 35% more fuel usage. Um, come on then, talk MPGs to us. Um, well, I've never measured the actual MPG, but it's definitely going to be uh, more fuel efficient on the rear of the vehicle. Yeah, that makes sense to me. Because in most instances, you've got a wake behind the, the car. So, like, what did you call it? Allometric scale, then? <laughs> well, yeah, maybe. maybe. <laughs> 
So it would be like that, but you're 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 <clears throat> increasing frontal area by having it on the roof, and you're not increasing frontal area by having it on the yeah. rear. Yeah, that so it seems like sound logic to me. Yeah. One thing I think I want to point out is for people that have bikes on the back of cars, as I've seen this quite a few times, is you quite often can't see the number plate or license plate if you're in America, and sometimes it obscures all the lights on the car. So just be mindful of like going about this in the I had a friend way. as well who had a car run into the back of him. Destroyed, his, destroyed his bike. Yeah. That's always my worry on having bikes on the back of a car. Yeah. And I mean, the most fuel efficient way is put them on the inside. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. it's still going to be less fuel efficient than having them on the inside. Yeah. Um, yeah. Next so, question. So, McLovin from Oz. Brilliant name. Good day, guys. Just to reaffirm his... <laughs> Australian. His location. Yeah. Um, with a greeting like that, there's no need to guess which country I'm from. Just further doubling down there. Great. Uh, resubmitting my question. I'm running Shimano 105 12 speed and had to change batteries in the hoods. Easy job, even for an idiot like me. I've run into a minor problem. The gears change as they should, but the battery check lights on the hoods aren't working. What have I done wrong? Thanks in advance. Oh, I can't say I've ever heard of this. Uh, what I would say is... I, I can't think of a common problem for what would cause this. I'd check the, the E-Tube app and see what's happening there. Yeah, I would see if the battery maybe status by is chance there. there's a firmware update that needs to be done and that's kind of like triggered it to, to mm. change something. You, hopefully you can see the battery status in the app. But I can't say I've ever had this problem. So if anyone in the comments has, I mean, get involved and, and share your thoughts if you've got a solution to this. Yeah. Uh, help us all out. Okay, right, next question is from at MB10KX. Hi, mm -hmm. GCN Tech team. Put some generic lithium-based ball bearing grease on my headset bearings. However, I read some grease may not be carbon fibre safe. They've got a carbon steerer tube. Some say this is a myth. Can I keep using like grease or do I need to clean it out and get a carbon fibre specific one? Um, so I have heard... Um, in the past, people mentioned that I think petroleum-based greases could potentially cause some sort of, not I don't want to say damage, but could change the chemical, chemical composition of the epoxy in a certain way to soften it. I don't know if that's actually a case, but I have heard someone mention that before. So what I would probably suggest is, if you're concerned in any way about that, would be to clean it all out and use a, a bike-specific product. Um, because... It's been checked and it's good to use on bikes. Yeah, generally, like lithium greases are generally fine. Yeah, but there you go. Um, in terms of the talking about get, oops, a fly on my nose. How did that get in here? Uh, in terms, of, in terms of using carbon specific grease, well, it's more a case of the carbon grease has got little fibres in it to help the carbon parts not slip against each other, isn't it? Uh, yeah. Okay. Well, that's yeah, assembly paste. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Right, over to you for the next question. Uh, Alberto says, Hi guys, big thumbs up for your channel. Is it possible to use an aluminium seat post on a carbon fibre frame? Is there a risk of damaging the frame or anything to consider, such as the minimum insertion length? I don't see there being any issue here, do you? Uh, no, just that uh, I'd probably use like an assembly paste on there. Yeah, 100%. And the, in terms of the minimum insertion length, it's going to be the same as, as what's on the seat post, regardless of the material it's made from. Yeah. Yeah, just don't exceed that limit. And also, you can, they can be, you can, it's, I mean, you do it the opposite way around. Often you'll put a carbon seat post in an aluminium frame or something, but yeah. you can get galvanic corrosion. So okay. try to avoid prolonged immersion in <laughs> yeah. salty liquids. There you go. Um, but yeah. Okay. And that was our last question of this week's GCN Tech Clinic. I say it every single week if we didn't answer your question. Well, I'm really sorry, but be persistent. Put it in the comments section down below and we'll get to it in the coming weeks. Yeah. Right. See Love you later. You. Bye. Bye.